This is SSN. Story Studio Network. I'm Tom Hoppy, and I'm your host of the Most Painful Podcast. On today's show, we're going to discuss post-surgical pain, what is post-surgical pain, rates of post-surgical pain, psychological interventions, and some helpful tips for those who are going through post-surgical pain. Talk to me about this today. I'm joined by Dr. Max Lepian, who is the Assistant Professor at the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine at the University of Toronto. Max, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Tom. Great to have you. I'm also joined by Dr. Hans Clark, who is also an Assistant Professor at the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine at the University of Toronto. Uh, Hans, welcome to the show as well. It's been a pleasure to be here, Tom. Thanks, Great to have you guys on. I know we kind of talked a little bit back and forth in, in uh, emails on, on this topic, so I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, Hans, maybe you can start us off by explaining what is post-surgical pain? Yeah, so, you know, Tom, chronic post-surgical pain or post-surgical pain can be acute. And anybody who has surgery within that first 48 to 72 hours usually goes through this response where, you know, it's due a lot to the incision and they have these nerves that are firing. There's an inflammatory phase. And then ultimately, it should go away. And for most, I would say about 85% of folks, it disappears into the past and there are no issues. But for an unfortunate uh, you know, minority, they go on to have these symptoms that linger. And once it becomes uh, longer than three months, we consider it a chronic post-surgical pain. And this is where you know, we really aim to figure out who go on to develop these types of longstanding symptoms and how we go about helping them uh, improve their trajectories if they do. Because many people don't even know that this is a consequence of something that uh, you know, may be at times life-saving, maybe at times elective. So uh, so somebody goes in for shoulder surgery and naturally, like you're saying, they're going to have some after effects of that as the body recovers and then, but it could, it could last longer. Absolutely. And, and for some people can cope with it and go on and over time manage it. And for some, they become really distressed by it. And, and almost if I had known, I would have never done this. And in some cases, that's not actually accurate because sometimes we're talking about life-saving surgeries in particular, when we're talking about cancer, when we're talking about removing uh, a disease entity, uh, almost everyone would still choose that. But if they were better prepared or had the knowledge that this may be a consequence, some of those folks may be better. And so that's why we designed this transitional pain program here at uh, Toronto General Hospital. We're, we've been on a 10-year journey. We're about to uh, come upon our 10-year anniversary, and we've really changed the course and ch- and notified you know the public that there is this gap and there's many parts of the world that have uh, kind of uh, even in the country and the world that have taken upon themselves to build services uh, similar to our transitional pain service so when we're talking about post surgical chronic pain is it my understanding the tissue and everything is healed but it's it's just lingering so has it become more psychological or is there actually still damage that in the tissue that's causing that pain to to continue yeah so it's, it's never one or the other i think tom i think you know we're not quite sure how everyone heals what we know there are lots of theories around why people persist with their pain some are simply physiological so that you have these nerves they were cut open you now have to have these nerves come back together and they Uh, haven't done it appropriately and now they're firing some people think well this is a good sign that i have this nerve pain that means my nerves are still doing something but then you have the cognitive part and you know that your brain can intensify a signal can also dampen down a signal and so that's why it's an interplay of the path the you know the physiology what's happening in your body how your brain is perceiving it how your brain is actually telling you this is a danger signal or this is something you need to take care of or this is something you need to live with those are all things that somebody has to deal with and then the third triad is is movement and how do you get back to doing things that are important to you and and moving on with your daily life and and these are really the things that people get stuck with and people need help with and one of the things that has been the the cornerstone of our program is the brain and pain interplay and and bringing that front and center early on because many people are fed up with that well it's in your brain or it, it's not real it's all real but it's also in your brain and how you respond to it um, uh, has a real role to play in how well you do and how fast you get back to that baseline of yours or cl- as close to that normal life as you had before you had that surgical intervention. So maybe Max, uh, like, can you expand on the whole brain and pain side of things then if we're, we're talking that there's a connection to this? 
I mean, it's a very complex interplay, you know, as Hans is uh, alluding to, right? That for and and surgery is an interesting case because, unlike other types of chronic pains, there's always some clear physical insult, right? That everybody's had a surgery, so it's always clear that there is something going on or has happened in the body, um, and then it's how does the brain act on it and what role does the brain play in kind of perpetuating that pain. Um, and so we can see from different types of surgery that even with very different types of, uh, you know, diseases that begin with different types of cancers, different types of, you know, thoracic versus cardiac surgery versus orthopedic surgeries, we have very different rates of chronic pain that, that come about. But also across all of these, we have really strong psychological predictors of, of chronic pain. So we know that having a lot of distress around uh, your pain at the time of surgery is likely to predict the uh, development of chronic pain. Um, and we can act on those as well. And so there's something in that that is kind of ramping up, as, as Hans was talking about, kind of the threat signal that our brain is, is picking up. And it's leading to a chronification, if you will, in the brain, as well as what's going on in the tissues. So that, yeah, that is sounds, I'm trying to unpack that in my mind, <laughs> that all <laughs> kind of ties in. But um, when we when we talk about that, you know, if it's lingering so long afterwards, does that impact like the rate of use of opioids or... Is there other, you know, do you try to obviously try to limit that? But is, I know in your email, you talked a little bit about uh, rates of chronic pain and opioid use. Is, is there an interplay between those two? And, and is, I guess the goal, is your goal to try to get people scaled off that and, and try to understand what's causing their chronic pain after surgery or how, how does that look? And open up to either one of you on that one. I'll jump in first and Max, feel free to jump in after. I think, you know, one of the things that was clear when the opioid crisis was front and center was that there needed to be a response from the physicians in particular. And we were being singled out as, well, you're the cause of this opioid crisis. It's clear that, you know, even though we've reduced our prescribing of opioids by 15% across the country, that the opioid crisis deaths continue to mount. And so I think there's been some clarity that it wasn't typically a, a physician-related issue or solely that. But, you know, we did understand that, you know, at times uh, we were prescribing a little bit uh, more opioids than perhaps necessary. And for many people, it didn't really matter because they weren't using it. Uh, they were putting it on their, on their you know, medicine cabinet for a rainy day. But unfortunately, some of those drugs on those medicine cabinets disappeared uh, very often. Uh, you know, uh, I often said to individuals, if you ever have a social gathering, please go and check and see if your opioids are there because we were in the heart of a crisis and these things were worth quite a lot of money. But that's the diversion issue. And so obviously more appropriate prescribing can reduce diversion. When we look at, you know, what the gap was for somebody who was struggling with pain after surgery, well, they were given this medication. They then would try to get help potentially for this pain problem. And the average wait time for a chronic pain center, as you sat there waiting to see someone who might be able to help you, was about, you know, 18 months, let's call it, in the country. And so what would happen to these individuals? They'd be ramped up using their whatever oxycodone they were on and be in the hundreds of 200 milligrams of uh, daily opioid equivalents. And then we'd have to see these folks. So one of the things we really uh, do is we really help people monitor and mediate uh, the need to ramp or escalate their opioids. Opioids are still the best medication for acute pain. And, you know, if I break my ankle or post-surgically, you better believe that 90% of the folks can still get an opioid post-operatively if needed. And the rate of persisting on an opioid is about 3%. It's a very small number when you look at the folks that are concerned about using an opioid acutely and landing with long-term use. So there's so many ways to look at this. And, and the opioid crisis is clearly uh, more so based at the moment in those illicit fentanyls that are being put into uh, you know, um, the illicit market and people are, are dying extensively. But we also had to, uh, you know, put our foot in the ring and say, look, we've also changed our prescribing practices a little bit in and around perioperatively. So one of our goals is to ensure good pain control. It's not to eliminate opioids. It's ensure it's to ensure that if they're being used, they're using it appropriately. Yeah, and I think if if I can jump in, like we were talking about, for the majority of people, they have a surgery, their pain subsides 
fairly shortly after surgery, they use the opioid while they they have acute pain. The, the pain goes away, they stop using the opioid, it goes up on the shelf or they dispense, dispense of it, uh, dispose of it appropriately. Um, but it was for those 15 to 40%, depending on the surgery, uh, that are, are sitting there waiting for a chronic pain clinic or waiting for going back to their surgeon and seeing their surgeon again. And, and the only option for many of those people is and was opioids. And so that's kind of where the transitional pain service comes in and that we're trying to see people, uh, within a couple weeks after surgery, we're trying to see those identify who is going to be at that high risk, who's really distressed about their pain right after surgery and see them as quickly as we can so that they're not sitting with that pain and waiting and continuing to use those opioids, except if, or unless it's it's warranted. So it, both of you have mentioned the transitional uh, pain program. Can can you talk a little bit about that and, and how that looks and, and works? Yeah, happy to do that, uh, Tom. So uh, we, we built this pretty early in about 2014. At the time we started with, you know, we had our acute pain service, our nurse practitioners, uh, myself and a colleague, Joel Katz, uh, were, the, were the two that thought about, hey, we know all about these things that predict who goes on to have a chronic post-surgical pain problem, but let's do something about it. And, you know, that coupled with the opioid crisis allowed us to kind of build this program. Dr. Lisa Weinrib was our first uh, clinical psychologist. Uh, she's since, uh, you know, uh, no, she's no longer with us at the moment. And Max is now our, our lead psychologist. And we really built this thing slowly. And we now have a, a you know, a practice that has uh, multiple nurse practitioners. There's two other psychologists that work with Max in the program. There is uh, a recent psychiatrist added to the team. We have a physiotherapist trained in acupuncture. And we now field uh, patients not only within the institution at the time of surgery, if you have a complex patient with a pain problem before surgery, we're happy to see them then. And we'll take patients up to about three to six months uh, following surgery that are struggling uh, that we think we can uh, help. I would say that, you know, if you get somebody within that first six months, that's probably the time you can have maximal impact. Beyond six months, it gets really tricky because, you know, patients uh, are, are quite distressed and that, you know, physiologically, it's hard to change something once it's been entrenched, uh, you know, after six months. And Max, on the psychological side, how does that uh, look for you in the transitional program? I, I mean, I, I would imagine it's also pre-surgery, not just post-surgery. Do you have it on both ends? I mean, I, I hope to see people kind of as early in the process as I can and say it's kind of with what Hans was saying, that the goal of this program really actually isn't to treat chronic pain. It's to prevent chronic pain, right? And so if somebody, uh, we have a couple of risk factors that we look for from a psychological perspective, things like uh, depression, anxiety, catastrophic thinking about pain, um, and if somebody is kind of flagged through their surgery clinic, through the uh, pre-admissions clinic, if they are flagged while they're on the ward, right, they're having a lot of uh, distress about their pain, we're going to see them as quickly as we can. And there are some psychological interventions that uh, have a lot of evidence and support for preventing chronic post-surgical pain or treating uh, pain during the perioperative period. And so um, there was a great meta-analysis came out a couple of years ago from uh, Bhutan Adinda and colleagues um, that showed a number of different types of therapy are effective for this cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, and so we kind of take and use those approaches. Um, and of course, uh, uh, ally and, and uh, liaise with what the physicians are doing to manage the pain and with what our, our physiotherapy colleagues are doing to manage pain. And so we kind of try to use all of those approaches simultaneously. And if I could just jump in and say that, you know, we may not be able to prevent chronic pain, Tom, but if we can prevent the disability associated with it by jumping on it early, that is as much a win as saying that we can actually prevent the pain itself. Uh, but, you know, I remember when we first started this clinic, I would see patients seven, eight years into their journey looking for their cure for their chronic post-surgical pain. I said, well, if you're seven years in and you haven't realized that there isn't going to be a cure found for this, we're, we're really in trouble before we even started. So this is what goes back to what you're saying about early intervention, like pre and 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 afterwards. Um, 
and 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 I mean, I guess with any chronic pain too, education awareness is very helpful. To absolutely. So does the program provide that prior? So if I'm going in for a shoulder surgery, is there, do I have access to that? If, uh, you know, I wanted to learn more, to be more educated on, you know, if I do have chronic pain, what I can do or what I should be made aware of, or is that available for somebody? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And so I can tell you that within our website, our transitionalpainservice.ca, we've created some modules talking about one, what is transitional pain service? One, what is chronic post-surgical pain? But we're also part of this um, uh, group right now that's aiming to build a pre-surgical module that we're hoping any Canadian from coast to coast, it will live online, that's going to have surgery, and it's not going to be ex- extensive and exhaustive. It'll be maybe a, we're hoping a 45-minute module that someone can log in and say, hey, I'm going to have surgery. Let me learn what some of the possibilities are that could be as my outcome. It could be amazing and I'm off to the races, or there might be some things I need to look out for and ensure that I have uh, somewhere to turn to for help after. And one of my soapboxes is that any institution doing major interventional uh, or major surgical interventions in particular needs to have a recourse for those you know percentage of patients that aren't doing very well. Yeah, because otherwise, like what I heard you say is that they have to wait to get into a an interdisciplinary pain clinic then and on their own or seek that out. Yeah. And I, I think getting this knowledge out there kind of takes two fronts. Like one is making it available as widely as we can. And that's what Hans is talking about and what we're really working on and trying to create digital interventions that can be employed anywhere that can uh, act, reach people across Canada. The other side of it is continuing to educate people that post-surgical pain is an issue, right? And that, you know, the problem is you go in for a shoulder surgery, you might never hear about it along that journey, right? And, and you know, it, it's one thing if you're coming to Toronto General and we're a really well-established clinic and you're seeing surgeons in the transplant service and they know of us and, and we're able to streamline through in a different way. But how do we reach people at community hospitals? How do we reach people, um, you know, outside of the GTA, right, that uh, are going to even know that this is an issue? And I, yeah, I agree. I mean, my own journey, uh, you know, understanding chronic pain or and pain service is very limited. And that's one of the reasons why we started this podcast was to provide that awareness for people and, and hopefully spark some interest and then they will have some places to go. So they you know your website will be on the, uh, when this goes out, will be on the, uh, on Spotify and Apple. And, and so it gives somebody an opportunity to, to look and learn from that, that point. But you talk about Toronto having this. Um, are there other places in the country that are doing the same thing or other public hospitals or is it more on private or is it a mix of uh, private and public? Yeah, it's a great question, Tom. And I, yeah, and I'll, and I'll tell you that, you know, like I said, it's been a 10-year journey. And across Canada, there are uh, you know, transitional pain programs. I think there's two in Vancouver now. Uh, there's one in Calgary. They're trying to build this model of care across the province. They have the ability to have, you know, one healthcare system. And they're not fractioned the where we are in on, Ontario. So they're, they're looking at putting in, as Max talked about, uh, a, a mobile component that anybody in the province can have access to, uh, you know, a central hub, so to speak. Um, you know, Newfoundland, one of our fellows, uh, she's heading out there to build the program and, and set up on the East Coast. So we're almost coast to coast now, and there are other centers throughout, throughout the country in the U.S., you know, hospitals like Vanderbilt, Duke, Utah, Brigham and Women's, and Harvard, these places all have these transitional type pain programs. And then they've created a, a special interest group in uh, in uh, the U.S. for this concept of preventing post-surgical pain, Germany, Norway, the U.K. So I think we've kind of made our mark in terms of, uh, you know, making a dent, hopefully, in the gap. And there's still, you know, uh, centers and countries that reach out to us to come and shadow. We just had a Japanese anesthesiologist visit us a week ago to see some of what we're doing and share our resources with them. And and I think, you know, we're pretty proud. There's still lots of work to do and, and we'll keep um, you know, trying to uh, help grow this and, and innovate and do new things. That's great. Uh, Max, if you were, you know, to the listeners, if you wanted to give them some pointers, some takeaways that might help them. Um, what would that be? One of the biggest things is to ask, right? Ask your doctor. If you if you're, know you're going to have a surgery upcoming, whether it's elective or more critical, can you, you know, ask, speak to your medical team about it? Because one of the things we know is that getting more information is going to help along the process, right? Getting more information is going to help many people reduce anxiety, 
right? Which is one of those risk factors for uh, development of chronic pain. And the other side is to take advantage of kind of what psychological resources there are, right? What PT resources there are, right? So if you can access our website, you can access um, other kind of um, nationally available mental health resources, even if they're not specific for pain, they're going to help kind of manage some of that distress that is a risk factor for development of chronic pain. Right. And so knowing about those things, trying to find ways to stay calm and positive through the surgical process um, is going to help build resilience. Did you want to add anything to that, Hans, from your your side? In terms of a take home, I think, you know, we've covered the rationale why we're here. I think Max's points about, you know, ensuring that, you know, where the resources are available. I think the one thing I'd add is we're trying to build uh, build out some online tools that the country can access uh, from a psychological perspective, because finding the high powered help like folks like Max is not that easy. And so it's one of the things on our radar to say, look, if you're struggling, can't find uh, a human being hey, why don't we log into this? There's a a new portal called the Power Over Pain Portal, which is, you know, uh, nationally funded. We might Mm -hmm. have some of our resources land in in that in partnership with them. So I think the future looks bright for Canadians, you know, if we can start to to basically mobilize this from an an online perspective as well. Yeah, and I think on our end, it's, it's about getting those resources into surgeons' offices as well and family doctors' offices so that people know about it. Right. And they can go on power over pain. Max, we were both thinking the same thing. That's the exact question I was going to ask there is, is how well educated are family doctors uh, about, you know, ensuring that they're sending their patients or, or directing them to the right resources to help them if they're going in for surgery? But I, I don't know any statistics offhand about how well, you know, how knowledgeable family doctors are, the surgeons are across Canada on these issues, right? But I know that we are trying to reach as many as we can and like um, different outreach programs, things like the Canadian Pain Society meetings that uh, we try to get this message out there, um, you know, and try to always involve other disciplines of medicine as well, I think, so that they're aware and that patients, even if they're not coming to see pain specialty physicians, anesthesiologists are able to get directed in that way, right? Yeah, I think everybody practices in their silos and we're all just trying to keep afloat. And, you know, the information is often there, Tom, it's just even the patients, how much, you know, it's such a nerve wracking time period, how much time are they dedicating to, you know, some of these aspects or they just, you know, am I going to survive is really their, their biggest concern. Yeah. And self-advocacy is, uh, is important for patients, I would suggest to really it's our health it's our body you know like you're saying the information's out there and maybe sometimes we just need to be pointed in the right direction and, and then we go from there so Agreed. well i appreciate uh, both of you on the show and we could probably talk about this a bit longer um but i think it was very educational and um I'd like to thank you both for being on the show thanks tom yeah thanks tom for having us on don't forget i'm going to plug the canadian pain society meeting in uh, ottawa so everybody come and join us. Yes, that's in Ottawa in April. You got it. Yes, I may actually see you there. So, awesome. Um, we're going to have more great episodes coming up in the next few shows. Uh, we're going to have one on supplements and pain, trauma-informed yoga. Uh, we're going to talk about hypnotherapy. Um, so hit the subscribe and like button. And uh, if you have any feedback about the show or more information on chronic pain, you can visit our website at veteranschronicpain.ca or follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Chronic Pain COE and on Instagram at Chronic Pain underscore COE. So once again, thanks very much, Max and Hans. And uh, to our audience, uh, stay safe and keep the hope alive. The Most Painful Podcast is produced for the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence by Story Studio Network. 